In this video, I would like to provide an overview of the consensual assessment technique as introduced by Amobile in 1982. I would like to provide a brief overview of what the technique is used for, how the technique is conducted, what are some of the potential things to look out for when using the technique, as well as some suggested reading material if you wish to learn more about the technique. In order to explain the consensual assessment technique, I would like to start by providing an analogy. When we watch major sporting events such as diving, gymnastics and ice skating, we observe that participants are awarded a score. This score is usually taken as the average rating by a panel of people who are very experienced in knowledge and experience of the sport. It is likely that the judges would have been highly skilled athletes in the sport at some time. From these points, it may be argued that they can be considered as experts in assessing the relative skill level of athletes from the sport. It can be asserted that in these sports, the judges are assessing a form of creativity and that their assessment is subjective. Although people may disagree with the rating given by the judges, it is likely that the scores awarded by the judges accurately reflect the creativity or skill level of one athlete compared to another in the applicable sport. Although the process for conducting the consensual assessment technique is different, it shares similarities to this process which may help you to understand. The consensual assessment technique was formally introduced by Amobile in 1982. In short, it is a subjective means to evaluate creativity. A quote from Amobile helps to describe the thinking behind the consensual assessment technique in a succinct way. The quote, a product is creative to the extent that expert raters independently agree upon this judgment. This will make more sense as we go through explaining how the consensual assessment technique actually works. I'll now briefly describe the process that is used to conduct the consensual assessment technique. First, people who are regarded as experts in the field are engaged as judges or raters. There is no specified number of raters that need to be used, though at least three judges are needed. More judges are good because it provides a more reliable result. The objects, often referred to as artifacts, that are to be judged may be from any field. These may be from the arts, such as painting, poems, or stories. They may be from engineering, such as products. From business management, these may be processes or procedures that are used by a company. Judges independently rate the objects relative to one another using a specified metric. This is usually done using a numbered scale, such as from 1 to 5 on a Likert scale. Raters may simply be asked to assess the creativity of something. However, raters may also assess other titled metrics such as novelty, appropriateness, usefulness, elaboration, neatness, or effort, or many other types of metrics. Such metrics arguably therefore allow the consensual assessment technique to actually measure metrics that may be considered as not being directly related to creativity. It is important to note that the judges do not have to justify why they give the rating that they do. It is sufficient that if the judges have a high level of agreement in their ratings, that the ratings should be considered as accurate based upon the judges' expertise of the topic. Once all judgments have been made, results are checked for inter-rater reliability. This is done by calculating a relevant statistic such as Conbrax Alpha, and it is used to show how consistent the ratings that the judges give are to one another. If reliability is high, the average assessment of the judges can reliably be used with confidence as a reasonable evaluation of the metric. However, if assessments are not reliable, the statistics should not be used. I have mentioned that in order to conduct the consensual assessment technique, it is important that the judges or raters need to be experts in the relevant field. This can often be an issue as it is often hard for researchers to actually find enough experts for their study. So therefore, it may be asked, why is it actually required, and why can researchers simply not use anyone? Well, the answer has to do with validity. It is more likely that when experts are asked to rate the creativity, or some other metric about a product, that their knowledge will allow them to provide a rating which more accurately reflects the real or appropriate score that should actually be awarded for that metric. A relevant study by James Calfin and his co-authors investigated whether it was valid to use non-experts instead of experts to conduct the consensual assessment technique. In this study, 10 experts 
who were published poets with numerous publications in respected publication locations, and 102 non-experts, who were college students, were asked to rate the creativity of 204 poems that were written by other college students using a scale of 1 to 6. When the results of this process were analysed, it was shown that the average rating by non-experts was approximately 4.5 out of 6, while that of experts was only about 3 out of 6. This shows that there is a large discrepancy between what experts and non-experts gave as a rating of creativity for the poems. Moreover, it was found that the creativity ratings of non-experts were a lot more inconsistent than that of experts. Therefore, people who were non-experts had much more varied opinions on the creativity level of the poems than the experts. This means that it is therefore harder to say with confidence whether the average rating of the non-experts accurately reflects the real or appropriate level of each applicable poem. When the raters have a higher rate of agreement in their evaluations, it is easier to assert that the average rating does accurately reflect the real or appropriate creativity level of each applicable poem. Reflecting on our previous analogy, would you want gymnastics or ice skating at the Olympics to be assessed by just anyone, or somebody who has an extensive knowledge about the sport? However, it is also important to note that other studies, such as that by Freeman, have found that the judgments of experts and non-experts can be consistent. This suggests that the use of non-experts may be accessible under certain circumstances, although this should be empirically tested beforehand. This then raises the question of who actually counts as an expert. Unfortunately, there is no clear agreement amongst researchers how much experience is needed before one can be called an expert. The widely used figure of 10,000 hours comes from a 1993 study. However, recent research has shown that this widely quoted figure of 10,000 hours may not be sufficient to simply count as an expert. In the original 1982 publication which introduced the consensual assessment technique, Amabile gives a reasonable description of what may be considered an expert. To quote, the method requires that judges be familiar with the domain to have developed over a period of time some implicit criteria for creativity, technical goodness, and so on. It is important to note that these judges need not themselves have produced work rated as highly creative. It is their familiarity with the domain that is important. Presented on this slide are the primary references which I have used to make this presentation. If you wish to learn more about the consensual assessment technique, I suggest that you look at the book chapter by Bayer and McCool as this is likely to be more widely accessible and has more general overview about the technique.